been attending our previous talks, welcome Brinklets. If you're brand new, welcome to the Brinklets, a little club of people that get together and watch these wonderful chats. If you're not familiar with Back From The Brink, we are an England-wide collaborative programme trying to save England's most endangered species from extinction, but that's not what we're here today. Instead, this series of talks is about shining a light on the rising stars in conservation. Today, we have a very special person who I'll introduce in just a moment. Before that, if during the course of this talk, you have any questions, any queries, any burning things that you need to get out, stick them in the chat and uh, we'll be gathering those up to ask at the end of the talk. Um, so with us today, we have the Nottinghamshire nature nut himself, the 15-year-old Indy Green. He's going to be talking to us about his work in volunteering and encouraging you to volunteer and make a difference in the way he has. And his long-term aspirations are to disappear into the wild somewhere and look at birds of prey, which who can blame him? I am delighted to introduce Indy. Hello, thank you very much. I would love to disappear most days, especially now. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for joining. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking a little bit about my volunteering work because I'm lucky enough, even though I'm joining you from a barn, I'm lucky enough to live, um, which by the way is the only place I can get network. Um, I'm lucky enough to live in Ritchie in the middle um, of the beautiful Sherwood Forest, the home of Robin Hood. So I've grown up around this amazing landscape and seen so many amazing animals and stuff and just had it all on my doorstep and it's literally been my playground. So without further ado, I will start screen sharing and show you what all the fuss is about. So, volunteering in Sherwood Forest, what a snazzy title that is, I didn't come up with it. So, this is Nottinghamshire, what an odd shaped county, and this is Sherwood, the little red dot, um, nicely situated far away from Nottingham City, City Centre, just as I like it. Um, and this is Sherwood Forest. So we've got the blue kind of the blue rectangle on top is Budby, which is a really nice big area of heathland that's connected to Sherwood, which is the lower rectangle just underneath it. Um, and my house is on there somewhere, but I won't say where. Um, and Sherwood pretty historically is it's spanned all the way up from Nottingham to York, and it was mostly um, birch and oak woodland pasture with some sort of some like wet patches throughout and it was nice sort of mosaic of woodland habitats um, and it still is now these are some areas that see some sort of sights and seas you can see in Nottinghamshire still so a lot of it is as you can see on the bottom right um, kind of forestry commission land where it's just these straight pines with not much in them and then we've got areas like Creswell Crags which is on the top left and it's this amazing amazing sort of massive gorge full of loads of amazing creatures and this is where we begin. So I'll start off with the depressing stuff first and then it will lighten up. So as you can see on the left, that is Sherwood Forest in 19, uh, sorry, 1787. And the green is enormous and it spans all the way across Nottinghamshire and I like, like I said, beyond. And pretty much all of what you can see there on the left would have been the oak and birch, the woodland pasture, the sort of the dense woodland and some more open glades and just a nice mix of loads of cool stuff. Um, but then of course, the present day on the right. And just above where it says Edwin Stowe, the block just above that is this Sherwood Forest, the one that I'm, the one I live in. Um, and that is the, one of the best remaining areas of ancient woodland in Nottinghamshire. The rest of it is pretty relatively barren forestry land, which not, with not much in it. But in, still remaining in the Sherwood Forest area, we have 997, ancient oak trees and those are trees that um do we sort of define an ancient oak tree by a tree that's over 400 years old and one of those is of course the very famous major oak now this tree we reckon is around 1200 years old and we know this because if you put, put take a tape measure and you measure all the way around the tree every meter counts for a, basically a, a hundred years of growth and that one is 12 meters round so that's why we reckon that um, but however, we also, there's some dispute over that because of these very old pictures here. Um, so as you can see, especially in the top left and the bottom right picture, Major Oak very, pretty much grew up on its own. It wasn't surrounded like the trees, as you can see in the bottom left there. It wasn't, it, it basically grew up in a field. So it had 
loads of room to really grow and just you know expand. I mean, imagine you know if if you're the last person on the planet, you're letting you're letting every single Tesco's in the rest of the world. You're going to grow, aren't you? So that's what this tree's had the option to do. Um, and what I love about some of the old pictures of these, if you look at the one on the top right, that's um, a picture from the Victorian era. And they actually pinned a picture of the major oak to the major oak, just in case you didn't know what you were looking at. Um, but the major oak is an incredible tree. It's got so, so much life in it. It's got a fantastic bees nest in the top left corner. It's got a wren nest inside it. It's a registered roost for brown long-eared bats. It's got a great tit. It's got a blue tit. It's got a nut hatch in the top, a jackdaw and a squirrel and a stock dove around the back as well. Plus, it's a bit of an icon for everyone. But it isn't just the major oak that we've given a name to out of the 997 ancient oaks in the forest. We have some of these fine, fine very fine specimens. Now, this one is probably my favorite. This is Twister, the very aptly named Twister. And this is an absolutely, simply incredible tree. As you can see, just the two, the, the two, two sort of separate parts of the tree that twist up. And then what the part of the back is still alive and the part of the front is dead, but she's still fine. It's completely hollow all the way up. I was, in, I was stood in the middle of a tree just a couple of days ago, looking up and just looking all the twists spiraling up. So Twister is definitely one of my favorites. The next one is Stumpy, the very also aptly named Stumpy. It's quite a small, it's kind of, as you can see, quite a stumpy tree, ignore the pheasant, quite a stumpy tree. And again, that's a registered root for brown long-eared bats as well. And this one is the man-eating caterpillar. Now this tree was named by the, ward, the current wardens of Sherwood, who were trying to encourage people to not go inside the tree. And they put a little fence around, but that didn't work. because they thought, how can we get people, especially kids out of the tree and prevent them from damaging it? So they decided to name it the man-eating caterpillar and created a myth that if a child or even an adult went inside the tree, they would be eaten by a massive caterpillar. That's a fairy tale. And then this is another one of my favorites. This is Medusa named after, I can't remember what her name was, but some, I think some sort of God with snake-like heads that looked very similar to this. And I absolutely love this tree. It's just, it, it looks incredible. I always think the bottom stump just looks like falling lava. It's just this really sort of stubbly, nice mess. And again, this is an amazing tree that looks like it's been cut off, but it's got all these shoots coming out from the left and right, which is absolutely awesome. And like I said, we've got 997 ancient oaks remaining in Sherwood Forest. And each and every one has their own individual tag. So if ever any work needs to be done on them, we can say, go to tree number 401. And then that tree can have a bit of work doing. So they've all got individual tags. And these trees, these ancient oaks, are what make Sherwood so special. And they're important for all the species they support. So when the tree gets to around you know, 500, 600, 700, or that sort of age onwards, the inside of the tree will actually start to rot out into what's called heart rot. Whereas, and the bark all around it and the sort of the, everything, the nutrients will remain but the inside will rot out. And the inside is absolutely vital for hundreds, if not thousands of different birds and invertebrates and just so much life, it's off the scale. And so many species will basically just live inside there, eat away at the heart rot for all their life and then come out and live for a beetle maybe for a week or something, but that's still their life fulfilled. And this is why Sherwood has got its triple SI status, the site of special scientific interest, yes. But we've got a problem. The age gap, which sounds like a super Channel 5 documentary. So we've got a lot of trees like this, which are quite young and really straight. And the inside of the tree is rock solid. So the vital part of basically ancient oaks and woodlands is that the inside is rotted out to benefit all those species. But we've got way too many trees like this and not enough trees like this. So this is the sort of tree I'm talking about. This is Frankenstein's bride. And the, literally the inside of this tree is completely rotted out and it's completely dead. And as you can see, we've put this very fashionable metal band around the tree, um, which cost quite a lot of money, um, to make sure that the right side of the tree didn't collapse away because otherwise it wouldn't be quite as valuable for insects and invertebrates. So we've made sure we kept that together um, to keep the tree standing up for a bit longer so it's more beneficial. Um, and we do lots of helping out actually. Um, so yeah. Have a little read, I'll shut up.
So these are sort of the natural things that can happen to ancient oaks. So as you can see, as you've been reading, the fungi kind of comes in and that creates those sort of rot holes. And that's, as, that's when the tree sort of starts to rot out inside. However, this is sort of natural vegetalization. However, we do have to sometimes step in. So this is what we've been seeing, a fantastic project that actually, yeah, we're back from the brink is involved with, no one's over then. Um, and this is deliberate veterinization. So these are some of the techniques that we saw on a really cool kind of rewilding day um, in a local nature reserve around here. And these are basically, as you can see on, you know, there's here. on the bottom left, we've got something called crown cuts, which is basically, so if you cut the top of the tree off, it's a bit bland, but if you cut it in like that, then the again, then that can sort of it starts to rot away a bit easier. And then you've got this nice standing piece of dead wood, as you can see on the bottom left. And then one of my favourites is the one pictured in the top left. So what they've done here, I absolutely love this. It's genius. They've cut away a triangle from inside the tree, taken it out, shaved a bit on top, put a plug in it, and then pushed the front back inside. So now behind that little strip that you can see on the top left is actually just space. So they've done this really low down on trees and sometimes really high up. And this actually enables birds to use it as natural nest boxes. So birds like pied flycatchers or marsh chits or tree creepers can now benefit from this while being a veteran feature at the same time. So we've got coronet cutting, we've got the rip cuts, we've got bruising, which is great fun because you just get a massive hammer and use the back of the hammer and just hit the tree, which basically replicates what bird, birds, like fantastic mammals like mammoths or, you know, you know, great big megafauna like that would have done back in the day. And of course, nest site creation. But again, we have lots of accidental or natural vegetalization, as you can see here. So on the reserve in Sherwood and the Heath and Budby, we've got loads of cows that love having a nibble on the bark, which then peels the bark away and then same sort of process happens. The tree starts to die and it's valuable for insects, et cetera, et cetera. And which is great. I absolutely love cows, especially these guys. They're really nice. And it's all for these species, not just these. There's a hundreds of them. Um, some of the snow small, you can't even picture them, but I absolutely love these guys. So one of my favorites is the one pictured in the top right corner. That's the black headed cardinal beetle. Now these beetles will only live, again, they'll live inside the heart rot, inside the ancient oaks, maybe a year or so, sometimes a summer, maybe two years, sometimes three years. Some species can even live up there into, you know, tens or hundreds of years. Uh, the black-headed cardinal beetle is usually two to three years. Um, and it will live inside the heart rot, inside the tree for two to three years, and then hatch out and turn into a lovely black oil beetle for maybe about a week. <laughs> but that's still its life fulfilled. As you can see, loads of other really, really cool insects. I think the Midius tree weaver spider is a spider that lives in old crow's nests. I might be wrong, but it lives in old crow's nests right at the top of ancient oaks. Um, so obviously if you don't have crow's nests or ancient oaks, then, well, <laughs> no more Midius tree weaver spiders. Now this is brilliant. It might look like an earwig, but this is actually the chrysalis of one of the most beautiful moths, in my opinion, on the planet. The Welsh Clearwing. Look at that, absolutely stunning. And Sherwood is one of the very few hotspots that you can actually see these gorgeous day flying moths. Um, in the UK, really, there's a couple of sites in Wales and there's some around the Midlands, but Sherwood's really got a good stronghold for them. I've never seen them, but there were quite a few reports last summer, so it's good to know they're still hanging on. But it's not just insects. We've also got loads and loads and loads and loads of amazing fungi. So as I said earlier, with all the fungi that rots down the inside, the ancient oaks obviously need that. So you've got species like this, which will help. Um, and yeah, just, and, and pictured here as well. Look at that on the bottom of the dead, of the dead ancient oak. It's got all the bark strips off um, that the fungi can now grow on. So like I said earlier, there's two, there's kind of two sides to share with. So the area close to the visitor center, as, as you can see, it, it pretty much looks like this. It's really dense understory and not, this, which is woodland pasture, and this is what a majority of Sherwood would have been would have been made up of back in the map I showed you at the beginning, with that long green stretch all the way across the country, a county, sorry. Um, and we've got only we've not, not even got that much of woodland pasture in in the Sherwood forest, but where we do, it's so successful. We've got species like woodcock, tree pipit, red star, spotted flycatcher, the occasional pie flycatcher turning up. We've got lizards in there. We've got nightjars, woodlark. The list goes on and on and on. It's absolutely super. 
And like I mentioned earlier, we've also got not just humans, but also grazing animals to keep on top of these areas. That cow definitely needs to get his finger out because that's very overgrown. And it's not just cows. We've got lots of really nice deer as well that often pop up over the place. And we do have a little video if it'll work. This is what the wardens filmed. Two lovely red deer. Maybe, yeah, three. Another one coming in on the, on the left. Nice foggy morning now. I think I know where that is as well. <laughs> How cool. Massive animals. Gosh. There we are. <laughs> so there is another area of Sherwood that needs a little bit of work, and that is Seymour Grove. And I'll just skip to the next one so you can see where it is. It is between Sherwood and Budby. I don't know if you can see my mouth, but there's a big block of pine woodland that basically separates Sherwood and Budby, which needs taking out because what we're really after is just a slow merge from ancient woodland, sort of a bit of scrub and then heathland just to go out like that. So it's just sort of a slow, um, I suppose, decline really in the sort of habitat, not ancient woodland, pines, heather. So that's not what we want. So we're in the process of taking out a big area of Seymour Grove to, yeah, transitioning forestry to woodland pasture, which is superb. And this is what the talk is about. So this is what I do pretty much every single Tuesday and every second Saturday in the month. It's the work parties. And I work with an absolutely superb group of people. I mean, admittedly, I hope they're not watching, but probably about the youngest by about 200 years. But um, they're all an absolutely super bunch and we're out there. I, I really hope they're not watching. Um, and we're out there, like I said, every Tuesday and there's so many cool jobs we're doing. So we recently created a ton an absolute ton, which was probably my favourite task of all, loads and loads and loads of bee banks. So these are solitary bee banks. So in, this, in the UK, we have around 270 different species of bees. And I think it's like 150 of those are actually solitary bees. And these are bees that will nest on their own. They'll make tiny little tunnels in uh, either horizontally or vertically into sandy banks. Um, these would be about kind of pencil width and pencil length as well. And then they'll have little chambers coming off. If you imagine, kind of like an upside down oak tree. It will sort of look like that, little chambers coming off. And in there, they'll lay their eggs and they'll obviously hatch and turn out into very, very cute little solitary bees in the spring. Um, we also do loads and loads and loads of scrub clearance. So have a look at this. This is before and this is after. So although we do need trees and Sherwood is obviously short of trees, it isn't all about trees. We need to maintain some for Heathland because we have lost a lot of the natural scrub clearers so you know bigger bigger mammals we don't have that many deer in the forest because uh, the heavy number of people that are around and also once the trees get to this height you kind of need to intervene as well so then we've opened this up and this area at the bottom i think has now got a pair of night jars thanks to what we've done so that's awesome but what benefits from these areas though what benefits from woodland pasture well 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 bats there's so, so many bat species in the forest. You can see this one, might be a brown long-eared in the front. Yeah, there's, there's quite a few. And this is another good little video. Not that one. There we are. This is a superb bit of film. This should feature on Country Farm of Winning to Watch. This is absolutely super. Have a look at this. So this is a fox, one of the warden team captured playing, it looks like a vole by the looks of it. And he's chasing it up and down, just basically like a domestic cat, and then catches it and then throws it, then picks it up again, right in front of camera. These cameras could have been placed anywhere and look what it caught. It's, and then just stalks it, just playing around, and then, it, then he watches it and then catches it again. It's absolutely superb. So these, we've got quite a few foxes in jail actually. It's got a decent population. <laughs> As you can see, yeah, lots of cute little fox cubs. I think one falls in a hole in a minute. Yeah, there it goes. <laughs> awesome stuff. So, this is my favourite part, the birds. This is the red star. This is a species I do a lot of monitoring with. So, just recently, uh, myself and someone from Sherwood were taking all the sticks out of the red star boxes um, which look like this. They're quite picky. So they don't like a classic sort of blue tip nest box, which is the classic sort of, I don't know, 28 millimeter, 28 millimeter wide hole. They like a little bit of light coming into the box. 
So that's why we've got these sort of like oblong holes, if you like, so a little bit more light in and they've actually been used, which is great. But in the forest, we've got around maybe 16 pairs of red starts. I think there was only 12 last year. There was a bit of a decline going on, but um, every nest I monitored was successful, which is really nice. They had really incredible feeding rates. There was one nest in particular in one of the glade pictures I showed you earlier, that the pair was bringing food in 18 times every minute. So that's cool in my opinion. That's really cool. And this is another good bird that benefits from this glade. Now the picture of here, you can see of the glade. This was this only this was only created probably around maybe 10, 15 years ago because this entire stretch of openness all the way through the woodland was just filled with birch trees. And the site team decided to clear it. And now it's one of the best spots in the forest. It's absolutely super. So we've got lizards in there. We've got these tree pipits you can see on the left. And these are, tree pipits are superb animals. They, um, they migrate here all the way from Africa. They've got a great little display and they sit right at the top of trees. And as you can see, they're singing their heart out and they'll fly up and then turn and then twist all the way down and land on the tree again. And that's just their display. And they nest right on the ground. They're absolutely super. And another ground nester and a really key species in Sherwood is the woodlark. Um, and I think I actually took these photographs on my birthday. I think I was cycling around on Budby and I fell off my bike when I saw it always sat so close to me. Um, but it was just sat on the fence line, ready to feed some chicks. And I actually do a lot of monitoring of these birds every kind of every once in a month. We get up at stupid o'clock way before sunrise and go out with our notebooks and go out onto Budby, onto the heathland and take note of where all the territories are, where certain birds are singing try and work out where some of the nests are under license. Um, and then, yeah, just work out how many we got. And the population is actually doing really well, which is great. And another species that benefits a lot from the volunteering work we do is the nightjar. And, oh, I mean, look, how cool, how flipping cool. And these are another ground nester um, that, like I said, a benefit from a lot from what we've been doing. So they like these open glades, these sort of stretches of heather with a little bit of scrub, a little bit of trees so they can sit on and chair. Um, and they're just absolutely super. You can see one that little picture on the right in the heather, absolutely gorgeous. And here's a little game. How many night jars are in this picture? We've got one, two, three. So cool, they're so camouflaged. You can see how they get away with it. Absolutely super. And another really cool keystone species of Sherwood is the spotted flycatcher. Now these are, these are, how big are they? They're, they're just a little bit smaller than robins and they, they've got a, I'll be honest, they're a bit boring. <laughs> they've got a rubbish song. They don't look that great, but they're really, really important species and they're in massive, massive decline. And then again, they migrate all the way up from Africa just to spend the summers in nice woodlands in the UK. And Sherwood is one of them. And we've got a really, really good population of them. So we're really lucky. No hatches. I love this picture. I think this picture taken by Lucy Lapwing. Absolutely super. Um, we've got loads of these in the forest. I love their going out in the morning, hearing it. That was just me whistling. I was trying to do an actual picture, but never mind. Um, I always think they look like bandits with that fantastic sort of eyeliner there. They're absolutely super birds. But this is the bit I've been waiting for. This is the star of Sherwood's show. This is the lesser spotted woodpecker. Probably the smallest woodpecker we have in the UK. I know I'll get that wrong. Um, but these are just sparrow-sized birds. So they're way smaller than great spotted woodpeckers, the classic one which you'll see in your garden. And these are probably the birds I spend the most time doing anything of forget revision forget homework these are i spend the most time with these birds um mainly because they're so incredibly hard to find and they're in massive declines like i said they're literally about that big and um, we've got a really good population in show which well, i say really good they're declining rapidly but all we try and do each year is find the nests of these birds and these are some of the ones we've been lucky enough to find so this was back in i think 2018 or 19 when we found two nests and bear in mind probably around five pairs in the forest we only found two of the nests which is pretty good and this so we're well, after finding the nest we called in a superb pair of experts ken and linda smith down from i think sussex and they came up with this really long camera um so we could have a look inside the nest and this is what we saw on the one on the left we put the camera in and we saw this male less spotted woodpecker sitting on how many eggs sitting on I can't count, sitting on seven eggs. And this 
this was just amazing. We didn't actually expect to see anything. We just thought it was a hole. We stuck it in. We stuck put the camera in and thought, brilliant. And this is the absolute bit I love. So as you get on, you can see the five pinkish eggs um, that are there. And they're, 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 as they get closer to hatching, they get more pink. So the two in the middle, it didn't look like they hatched because they were still quite brown. But the more pink they get, um, yeah, the more, yeah, the more likely they are to hatch. Um, and it's actually the male lesser spot, as you saw just back here, that does most of the excavating and the incubating and caring of the chicks once they hatch. So although in most cases, it's most other cases of birds, it's normally the female that does all that. But in lesser spots case, the female is quite lazy. And sometimes even the once the chicks get a bit bigger, but they've still not left the nest, the female will just leave and leave the male to it. And this is what we've not seen with this one, but we have in a minute. And this is what we saw when we checked again. So we've got, I think, three chicks there and still a couple of unhatched eggs, which was super. And eventually they all grew. You can see the three chicks there. And actually what's great about woodpeckers or woodpeckers, I believe, is that you can actually tell what sex they are before they go through their first molt. Yeah. So the one with the red dot on the head is the male and the other two are just tiny females. Um, there was, we watched, it was, the, it was the most pleasurable thing I've ever done most brilliant thing I've ever monitored because we would watch the, the adult, the male and the female coming in and feeding the chicks most days. It was absolutely super, absolutely super. And there was a bit of kerfuffle when some people found out about it and then Grace Grills and the woodpeckers found about it. But eventually um, I photographed this one um, just above the nest, calling away to the adults, begging for food. So they all hopefully fledged successfully, which is really great. And the second nest is this one. So this was found, we didn't find them when they were eggs actually, we found them when we heard the chicks begging and they were just begging and begging and begging, that's how we found them. And that was a really, really high nest. We had to extend the camera pole, it was so high. And then this is actually a case where the female had left and left the male to it. And as you can see, they two both really nice looking chicks on the right there. And I believe they're both fledged successfully, which is really nice. So these. That's one of the favorite species that I absolutely love to monitor as part of the volunteering work I do at Share. It's absolutely super. And another very, very keystone species in Sherwood is the marsh tip. And these are pretty much the same size. They're pretty much, yes, yeah, pretty much the same size as blue tits. And they'll nest in kind of stumps relatively close to the ground. And their call sounds like they're sneezing. So it's a pee choo, pee choo. Great call. Another star of Sherwood is the tawny owl. And this is a very, very charismatic tawny owl that always likes to sit out in the day, which allowed us to get some superb views. Really, really cool. <laughs> Going back to some volunteering, we do it in all weathers, absolutely all weathers. Um, and we actually create habitat for a lot of these species like I mentioned earlier. So here we've got quite a dense glade that again has been taken over by pine trees and birch trees that wasn't really, not even much room for us, let alone wildlife. So out in the rain, we went out on Tuesday and made a bit of space. <laughs> and that's this area now has night jars and cuckoos in it. And we only did this maybe two years ago, which is a superb result. And this area, like I said, it's got cuckoos. And one of the cuckoos we were lucky enough to see is this one. So this is Robinson. So the BTO do a fantastic cuckoo tracking project. Um, if, yeah, and they had one cuckoo they tagged in Sherwood called Sherwood, ironically, and another one in Sherwood that they called Robinson. And this was Robinson. Um, so every day before going out in Sherwood, I would look at my phone, see where see where the bird was and head to that location in the morning. Um, and you can just about see with the little arrow there, you can just about see the tiny little antenna coming off, not antenna, the tiny little wire coming off the track um, on, on the cuckoo's back there, which doesn't bother them at all. They're absolutely fine about it. Um, but unfortunately, Sherwood, the other cuckoo, that cuckoo we believe died in the bush in the Congo before coming back. So that was sad. And then after spending the summer here, this cuckoo, Robinson, flew into a conservatory in London. And that was that. So that was a bit sad. So, but cuckoos are actually, it's, it gets even worse, are expected to have pretty much left Sherwood within the next 10 years. So despite the work we've been doing, the intensive of agriculture around is not there's not much, really much food left for them, to be honest, even though there's, in cases, the habitat, there really isn't much for them to feast on. This is another species, I was about to say bird then, another species we've been doing a lot towards is the purple hair streak. And we have really, really good numbers of these in Sherwood. So what we've been doing, we've been opening up some areas 
um, as part of the volunteering work, lifting the crown, because these are species that like to hang around on oak trees. They'll lay their eggs on oak trees. And I only saw my first one last summer, actually. So that was really cool. And this is another, I'm saying this a lot, it's another really, really cool species that we get in share with. This is the gray dagger moth caterpillar. And as you can see, chilling out there on an ancient, ancient oak. This is actually chilling out on Frankenstein's Bride, the tree that I showed you earlier. Now then, beetles. These are species that we've been doing a lot of work with. So these, this is the green tiger beetle. And we've already been seeing these on some of the scrapes that we've been digging on the work parties. Um, so they will, again, they'll dig a tiny little tunnel, lay their eggs in it, and then it will ha they'll hatch out into this relatively relatively long and quite ugly looking lava that I saw myself for the first time a couple of days ago. And these larvae will sit in these pencil sized holes like that with their mouth facing upwards up to the sky with an open hole on top. And they'll wait for any victim to fall into the hole and then they'll just eat it. So it's just, to be honest, this is the better man eating caterpillar really. So yeah, they'll just sit there, wait for a species like an ant or a bee or just anything that will fall in that's unlucky enough to fall in and just gobble it up. So that's the green tiger beetle. And this is the very awesome black oil beetle. And James is very happy that these are featured because I absolutely love them too. So this is this is the this is the male or the female, I believe. And the, the females are around this long. And the females and the males are around this long and they really are quite massive for a beetle. Um, and at this time of year, they started emerging back in, I think it was, it was early April when they started emerging and they'll hatch out of these small holes in the ground and the male and female will find each other, do what they do. And then the female will go off, <laughs> female will go off and dig a little hole and then lay sometimes, sometimes up to hundreds of eggs, I believe, in this hole that will hatch out the same spring and turn into something called triangulants. And these are just a milli millimetre lot, absolutely tiny things um, that will then wake up, come out the hole and look for the nearest flower head. And somehow, being that small, they manage to travel, travel quite some distance, go up the stem and get right to the top of the flower head. And these will emerge in their thousands, absolute thousands. You'll just get one day, usually in the first couple of weeks in May, when they'll all just go, right, today's the day, chaps. And they just go and they're all climbing up these stems. And what they're doing is waiting for solitary bees to come and visit these flower heads just casually looking for nectar for their own, for their own, I'd say chicks, for their own eggs and young. So what these triangulants do, like I said, they're on the top and then the bee comes along and the triangulants will actually grab on, they don't have arms, they won't do it like that, but they'll grab on to the bee's back or the bee's legs and wait and wait for the bee to go back to its own small pencil sized burrow in the sand somewhere else across the reserve. And then once the bee gets back with the triangulants still holding on, uh, the bee will go down into the burrow, into the chamber where the eggs are and where it has all its own nectar collected for its own young when they hatch. The triangulum will hop off and eat all the nectar that the bee had ready for its own young, including the bee's eggs. And then they will feast on that nectar and the young throughout the winter and then emerge in the spring as a gorgeous looking black oil beetle. And that relationship is called kleptoparasitism, paras parasitism. Round of applause for the black oil beetle. How cool is that? Um, and these, these are really, they're, they're quite, they're nationally scarce, these beetles. So what we're doing, we're creating these basically sandy paths all the way across the reserve. Because obviously for these beetles to be successful, they need solitary bees as well. And it's relatively unfortunate when a wasp or a bumblebee picks them up because then they just die in, in their big nest. Um, but so what we're doing, we're creating these sandy scrapes all across the reserve. So you've got a good population of bees and beetles and that's, this sort of improvement and progress with the population spreading across the site, because before they're only permitted to basically permitted, they're only found on one path. Whereas now we're seeing them spreading across the site, which is absolutely fantastic. So when the triangulants come up, bees pick them up and take them even further. And that's how it works. They slowly spread. And that's thanks to the work pretty much that we've been doing, which is absolutely, this is the, that, that's as rewarding as it gets when you actually, you set out to do something and it works, which is absolutely brilliant. The future. Oh, the future. What a fun thing to think about. But I would love these guys to turn up in the forest. These are wild boar. And I see a lot of these when I visit the Netherlands most years. And these are absolutely super. So these pretty much do what we've been doing. They turn over the soil and allow the bit of bare scrapes and they'll sort of get rid of some saplings that we don't want. 
um, and you know create these bare areas for the solitary bees to come and inhabit. So they're pretty much saving us a big, big job. Um, we're also really hoping, which again is quite long term and relatively ambitious, is to connect some of the areas of Sherwood Forest up again. Because as you can see on the map earlier on, um, there's only tiny fragments of Sherwood Forest left. So one species might not be able to move any further. And we're seeing this a lot with species like woodcocks and night jars um, that will just, once they arrive back from Africa, or woodcocks in this case, just stay there because um, they're a resident, they won't, they can't move out of their little forest block where they're sometimes born, they won't even move that far. Um, so sometimes what they will do is follow hedgerows to the next patch of woodland, but there isn't hedgerows everywhere. So we're trying to basically just merge lots of areas of the forest together, creating nice wildlife corridors all the way through, um, which is why I absolutely love volunteering. And I cannot stress how much fun this is. Um, I mean, this being basically being a talk about some of the species that benefit, but now I get to talk about why, because it's so rewarding. It's so unbelievably rewarding, especially the practical stuff. So I got involved with volunteering in Sherwood just after the RSPB took it over in 2018. And I've been doing some of the visitor stuff, doing guided walks and things like this. This is an old talk I used to do. Um, and it's just absolutely superb. So a lot of people just think kind of volunteering, yeah, I suppose campaigning and stuff is, has to be online and stuff and trying to save nature, you just sort of share petitions and stuff. But which is which you can, and it's super. But there's so much more fun to be had, especially outside, which is what we're all trying to do anyway. Um, so yeah, like I said, every single Tuesday we're out there in the sunshine or the pouring rain, making habitats for these species. And a lot of people think, well, I don't have Sherwood Forest on my doorstep, so I can't do that. And I know, to be fair, I know I'm quite lucky to live where I am. But more often than not, there'll be a little nature patch, a little nature reserve, not even far from where any of you live. And there'll be always, people are always up for volunteers to help out with the work that they do, whether it's the council, the National Trust, the Wildlife Trust, the RSVB, just anyone, they'll always be up for volunteers to help out. So I cannot stress how important it is to do the practical work on the ground. You get loads of experience, you get loads of cool tips, and loads of cool info, you get to see loads of amazing wildlife, plus it's so, so rewarding. So if you can, if there is somewhere around you, please find out if they need your help. And if not, you can come sleep in the barn. You can help me out every Tuesday because it's great fun. So thank you all very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. And I hope you, if you have any questions, do let me know. That was absolutely cracking. I thoroughly enjoyed that. And you know why? In part, because, yeah, we can all kind of go places now. But I haven't seen any... I haven't seen much wildlife since we've been able to get out anywhere. So it's just so nice to see all these lovely photos and yeah, hear about what you've been up to. Um, also, I need to get back to Sherwood Forest. It's absolutely cracking. Um, Super. Right. So we've had quite a few good questions. Um, uh, so I'm going to put those to you now. Can I jump in there first, Jack, if that's all right? Uh, yeah, I'll allow it. Oh, yeah. thank you. That's very good. <laughs> Um, I just want to say that you've besmirched my favourite bird, the spotted flycatcher, and um, <laughs> I'm terribly offended. I bet you're this kind of person that if you see a spotted flycatcher and a pied flycatcher, you're like, oh, that one's all black and white and showy, and you prefer that one, don't you? Admit it. Um, yes, I will happily admit that, because I, was, I spent the whole day yesterday watching pied flycatchers thinking, wow. James Harding Morris would say they're easily pied spotted flycatchers are much better, but they're stunning. <laughs> they're both really good. But, you know, I mean, I, 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 I really hope Jack Bradlands isn't watching this because I help him out with a lot of his spotted flycatcher studies that he does around here. Um, so yeah, yeah, surprisingly, I absolutely love these birds, but um, they don't grab my attention quite as much as, say, a goshawk or a vulture, shall we say. <laughs> Well, fair enough. Uh, Jack, when, we, um, when we're advertising this talk for like people to watch again on YouTube, please tag Jack Badham's in so he sees it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> please. I will. Uh, um, terrible, terrible. Um, no, no, yes, now back to Jack. Now I've, I've vented my spleen. Back to you, Jack. <laughs> well, we're going from light-hearted bird question straight into the deep end. Oh, no. A question from Grace. <clears throat> she's asking is there any evidence that deliberate veteranization works yeah it does 
And actually, there was uh, there was a really great. Um, I'm not sure of any studies of it. I'm, I'm I'm sure there will be if you look them up. But there's um, was it last year? Last year or the year before? Um, it was a project run by Back from the Brink in, in conjunction with the council and the RSBB. And they came to Sherwood and did loads of cool kind of like light and sort of imitations of lightning in the trees. And they cut areas out and just um, basically, I mean, what you're doing is replicating what would have happened back then. Like I said, with bigger species, the mammoths and bears rubbing up. I mean, probably not in this country, but mammoths and bears, you know, rubbing up against the trees and creating those sort of um, the natural damages that would have been there. Um, so like I said, with the hammer, you turn it around and hit the tree that peels some of the bark off and then the fungi is allowed to grow and the whole rotting process begins. So, um, and you see that really, we see it all the time. We act, so it, it's definitely, it's evident if you come there, you can see it really plainly. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, the idea of it is to imitate what would have happened to trees during their lifetime. Yeah. Um, but obviously there's a big gap there, like you said. So you have to imitate it on trees that may not may or may not have lived long enough to actually have experienced any kind of those um, natural effects on them. So yeah, really, yeah, yeah. You're, you're imitating a, a, a lifetime, aren't you, in a moment? Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's, it's absolutely that. And the reason why we're so, we probably wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't for the age gap, because if, if it was like a natural process, it was because I think it was around the, 17th century thousands and thousands of trees were taken out of Sherwood to build I think ah oh, was it was the HMS fig tree it was some sort of warship and there was now so now we've got this massive age gap between because of course when back in their day way before I was any of us were born I can say that now um they would have taken out all the really nice tall straight trees which were being good for building boats um and now we've just got this massive age gap the sort of the 500 year age gap now we've just got trees that are maybe 200 three old 300 years old and all of a sudden, you know, these whacking great thousand year old, thousand year old ones. So it's just this age gap. We're trying to bridge the age gap and um, select some trees to kind of shorten their lives for the sake of what would have actually happened in the first place. So we probably wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't for this age gap. But we just need some of the younger trees to catch up with the older ones a bit quicker than they would have. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully in a, you know, 100, 200 years, we won't need to. No. I think um, another thing to think about is when we talk about um, kind of um, creating a hole in a tree or simulating lightning damage. I, I remember um, somebody on our Ancients of the Future project telling me once that with an oak tree, they, they in ideal conditions, an oak tree will spend 300 years growing, 300 years in the prime of its life, and then spend 300 years slowly kind of decaying um, away. So when we talk about kind of giving younger trees these characteristics, and we talk about maybe possibly like shortening their lifespan to some degree, we're still talking in a, in a spectrum of, of decades to hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes people people think you're just going out and killing a tree. And in yeah. fact, you're, 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 you're putting these, 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 these elements into them that will kind of change how they grow and develop over the next few centuries. Absolutely, because it, I mean, if we go out and hit it with the hammer, it's, it's not going to collapse tomorrow. So it's, um, it's it's definitely a massive, as as like I said, as it is with trees, they they they're not they're not quick growers. So it's it's a, such a long, but definitely I think worth it process. Really, it it really is really important, especially in Sherwood with this age gap. Yeah, cracking, great question. Um, next one's from Lisa. It's another kind of habitat species question. Um, would you say that wood pasture is even more important for species than forest? Poor. It's difficult because you get different species using both. Um, so that, that's, I probably think they're equally important. Um, so I, it's probably biased because I prefer the species you get in wood pasture than you do in dense woodland. But um, and sort of red starts and stuff, but I, I I think they're definitely equally important. But what we don't we don't have enough wood pasture in the, in the forest, which is my point. So we have way too much the dense brambly stuff, which is good, which is still good. But there's loads of that across the UK, and we just don't have enough of these sort of open, sometimes wetter areas um, for more specialised species like you know woodlarks and these red starts and night jars, which are all in decline. 
So I think it's definitely important to have both because you get different species benefiting from both. Yeah, yeah. You're kind of um, resetting the balance, I guess. A little yeah. Bit. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, Grace has got another um, good question here. Uh, are deer good for woodland though? Thought they ate the saplings. Well, yeah, so this is the thing. So deer are very, very controversial. So um, up in the Cairngorms in the highlands of Scotland, most mountains, at least a lot of them, should be just covered in forest. Absolutely just, you know, right from the top to the bottom, maybe not a complete top, but full areas should be just a lot more forested than they are now because I was up in the Peak District yesterday and I was just looking out over this barren of this landscape of just nothingness. And it was just burnt grouse moors and no saplings and... That's not necessarily enough, not necessarily because of the deer there, because I didn't really see many deer there. But in the Peak District, uh, sorry, in the Cairngorms especially, there are way too many deer because they, of course, have no natural predators anymore. There's no, there's no wolves, there's no lynx or anything. Um, so they've just been able to just breed and breed and breed and now multiply. And now there's just thousands. Um, so there's a lot of culling going on with deer to try and reduce the numbers because, like I said, they do eat a lot of saplings. But in areas of Sherwood where we don't really have that problem because there's always people power, um, we don't mind deer. Um, but in areas of Sherwood as well, actually, because there's so many people, we don't really get that many deer coming in anyway. So that's why we're doing so much that we are, because if it was completely natural and completely, you know, if the whole area was quiet, we would have quite a lot more deer, which would maintain the new saplings coming through, which is and isn't important because, again, you need both. You need these open areas and you need, because of course deer aren't going to eat every single sapling, unlike they do in Scotland where there's just nothing. So um, we, we, yeah, we do definitely need both um, sort of the open areas, like I said, and the closed areas and deer help us achieve both really. Um, but in Sherwood, they aren't really much of a problem. They're all good. Yeah. Cracking answer there because that is a particularly controversial topic as many people in conservation would um, agree on. Um, and disagree on <clears throat> so yeah, yeah. um and jack, jack can i just um jump in sorry i'm always jumping in and bothering you but <laughs> i live for it um I, I, I was just thinking um it's, it's more of a re reflection than a question but uh indy you were telling us about how the major oak is over a thousand years old some people think what was it 1200 did you say yeah 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 and it's amazing to think because um we kind of think, oh, well, bears are gone and wolves have gone and lynx have gone and all these predators that we coexisted with. I mean, generations ago, so long ago in the dim and distant past, it barely bears thinking about. And yet the major oak would have been alive, overlapping with wolves for hundreds of years. You know, wolves disappeared in the 1700s. And um, I think the latest remains of lynx in the UK are about what are they, a little over a thousand years old? So it's amazing to think that this one individual tree in its lifetime went from a, a, a country with possibly lynx, definitely wolves, wild boar, and, and it is in the present now. And it, I, I suppose I'm just thinking about how, if you think about things like a tree, how different our perception of, of the country and conservation is when you kind of think on those kind of timescales. Absolutely. I, I, I love, I'm glad you brought that up actually, because I love thinking about this because whenever, because um, we do a lot of talks in Sherwood and stuff about, you know, the star of the show, the major oak and what that tree has seen. And we always go on about the, you know, the endless battles it's seen. But my favourite side of it is like you say, what sort of the changes in natural history that tree's seen, because it's pretty drastic. Um, and I would just love, love, love to go back in time and just kind of see what it was like and see all the different species. Because you know, even people not that long ago, people older than me, um, who tell me about species like pie flycatchers and wood warblers that used to be in Sherwood that we've since lost, not even, you know, like maybe like 20 years ago. So imagine what it would have been like back in the Major Oaks day and what that tree seen. It's, it, it's, it, it's, it's kind of sad and incredible to think about what that tree seen. But yeah, you're right. Yeah, I, I think really what you're kind of articulating there is that is that changing baseline idea yeah. that that what we grow up with we think is normal and then we see this little decline in our life but then everyone it's hard to imagine what a kind of full thriving country full of wildlife looks like yeah um yeah i mean as you're talking about like um it's like i've met older birders and they say i remember when you could stand on a coast and you could watch a hundred turtle doves you know flying off the coast at migration it's just 
unfathomable. I met a birder once who remembers seeing a small flock of Rhinex land on a field in Dorset, you know, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of unfathomable. Uh, I mean, thinking of that major oak again, that tree almost certainly um, at some point in not the distance past had red squirrels playing in its branches, which are now completely gone. It's just, yeah, absolutely amazing to think about and, and a little bit, I don't know, um, daunting, a little bit saddening to kind of think about how difficult it is to perceive that change. Yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. It, it's, it's, yeah, it, I'm, I'm just sort of, every time I sort of think about sort of back in the day, um, it's, it, 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 it is quite sad actually, because I think Budby actually was the last place in Nottinghamshire where Redback Shrikes nest, um, uh, nested. That was, again away before my time but yeah to think about what's changed and what this forest and that particular tree has seen is just incredible mm. you know um you know what i hope though i hope that in your lifetime indy you mostly see the positive change because I, I you mentioned some people you knew james but i remember um but my mum's budlier in her garden just covered in butterflies but now you look at it and there's a couple but I, I remember like swarms of them all over it. And, you know, I'm only 33. So, you know, even the change within my lifetime is pretty drastic. Um, but I think I think we're on the turn. I think um, someone your age, Indy, or a bit younger is going to see a lot of the reverse, I hope. Um, here's a lighthearted one. I, I personally, I think Woodlark is the best bird song. What's your favourite bird song? End of questions. I agree. I absolutely agree. Hundred and two thousand percent. Woodlark best bird song. Nice. Honestly, my favourite. Absolutely love it. Nice, Same. nice. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Go on then, Jack. What's yours? Woodlark. Oh come on! You can't all say woodlark. I said, well, no, no, I said my woodlark, and then asked Indy, and his was woodlark. Oh, sorry, I thought you were reading it out. I did. No, it was just me. I was just. Oh, you were you were looking. Oh, yeah. I thought you were reading one. All right, okay. <laughs> What's yours then, James? Nightjar. I thought you were that stuff was stuff. You, you, you're portraying spotty flycatchers now. Oh well, I didn't say that. I I said they're like they're great. They're classy with the, with a the spotted flycatcher. It's about. Um, a spotted flycatcher is like a nice glass of wine. Like they're not, it's not really nice, but you pretend it's nice, don't you? Because it's wine. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but, but with the spotted, oh, with the spotted yeah. flycatcher, I love how they sit upright. I love the little, their little flights they do to grab things. Fantastic. The song, pitiful, nightjar. <laughs> is the best song because what I want in a bird is for it to sound like a giant insect from a horror film. Ideally, amazing. that's the ideal bird noise. Giant yeah. insect. So yeah, it's a nightjar, grasshopper warbler, savvy's warbler, all great. I want birds to make noises that they shouldn't be making. Basically, <laughs> nice, nice. Um, okay, let's go back to the more serious questions. Um, uh, one from Gwen here. Are lesser spotted woodpeckers rare? I thought I had some in the garden, but they turned out to be greater spotted woodpeckers. Yes, yeah, so less spots, they are really restricted to certain spots. Like as, like you saw on the map there, they've got this kind of only tiny fragments of habitat left across the UK. Um, and yeah, again, the great spots will be the ones you see in the garden. Less spots, I've known one or two people have had them in their garden before, but, you know, they just probably live, you know, in the Forest of Dean or something. Um, so it's incredibly, incredibly rare to get them in the garden. But um, yeah, they are, they're really rare and unfortunately declining, which is why we're doing our best here to monitor them and make sure no nothing or no one disturbs them to try and get the numbers up again. But yeah, they are, they are pretty rare. Yeah. yeah. I've encountered, um, I think, I think because uh, everyone kind of has heard of lesser and greater spotted woodpeckers, I think there is a tendency for people to assume they've got lesser spotted woodpeckers when almost entirely they're greater spotted woodpeckers. Um, I, um, I think they're monitored by the rare breeding bird panel now. I think they've had such a huge decline. So um, yeah, um, anyone that happens to see a lesser spotted woodpecker in the garden is, well, I'm just super jealous of them and very annoyed that I'm not getting that. <laughs> 
um okay someone's someone's come in with um but what about lap wings they sound like alien daleks they are pretty good lap wings actually to be fair yeah they, they are, i was listening to some lap wings yesterday actually when i was up in the peaks and it was there was, there was one mobbing a raven and it was going up and down. I was like, wee, 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 doing all that. And it was, oh, it was gorgeous. Um, so yeah, lap wings are good. Oh, we can all agree on lap wings then because I, I don't, I think their noise sounds, I don't know, a little bit unearthly. So that, that kind of fits into my category of birds not sounding like birds should. So we're, I'm on board with that. That's good. You're happy. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's all, also what matters. That's what we're here for. <laughs> um, a bit more seriously. I'm really interested in the moment you decided you wanted to get into volunteering for nature, Indy. What was it that, like, just sparked that little bit of extra drive you need to go and do it for the first time? Wow, wait. Um, I think, I mean, I only realised that, this sounds bad, but I only realised Sherwood Forest was on my doorstep when I was about maybe nine or ten years old when I realised, oh, actually, I've sort of been sitting in my garden, which is kind of in Sherwood anyway, but then I sort of realised, oh, actually, it's quite cool over there, isn't it? I'll have a wander in there. Um, and then I remember first, so how it kind of all started was with me going to lots of RSPB stalls and buying their very classic and famous pin badges. And they're all, you know, a couple of quid each. And I've got a bag full of just pin badges. And, oh, have I got one on me now? Yeah, I've got one on me now. This is a goshawk. As always, gospel pin badge. Um, and I met some great people there. One of them was Andy West. And he just sort of, I mean, I kept meeting him. I met him at every, basically every event I was there. And he just saw me. And he'd always take a picture of my bag and he'd sell me loads of pin badges. Um, and then I met him one time when he was at Sherwood. And he said, do you volunteer? For, do you volunteer for the RSV at all? I just said, oh, no. Um, he said, you should try it. And then I was like, ah, yeah, maybe. Um, and then I went to the visitor centre to find out a bit more. And I was basically put on their kind of the visitor centre duties, which was um, trying to flog membership and talking to people, which was nice. Um, but I just wanted to get outside a bit more. So then I met Jack Baddams, actually, spotted fly catcher lover, who, um, who got me outside and he got me doing all the walks and everything. Um, and then I realised, I kind of realised when we started talking about some of the species, because he's an absolute bird nerd. Um, and actually Lucy Lapping as well, she worked there at the time and um, she, oh, she, gosh, she knows me, absolutely loads. She taught me so much. So it was, it was both of them really, who just took me out in the forest most days and they were just saying, well, that's declining, that's declining, that's declining. Um, and I was like, oh, that's a bit rubbish, isn't it? Um, and then I met some people, um, Chloe who works out on Budby um, and just asked if I could join the work parties. And I've just, it's honestly the highlight of my week. It really is. So just basically it all started when I learned about what was happening just on my doorstep and wanted to change it. Um, so that, that was it really. Nice. That's cool. Uh, that's I, really, <laughs> oh, sorry, Jack, carry on. Uh, I was just going to say, I, I came to it really late in life. I was into nature when I was like 10, 11, 12, then completely lost interest. And then when I was about 24, 25, wanted to career change and to start that shift into what I do now, um, I went and did some residential volunteering with the RSPB. But yeah, up until then, I hadn't really done anything. But, you know, it's, it's, you're never too late to start, you know. I, I think it's really I, I, interesting. I really, oh, sorry, Indy. I, no, I was going to say, I, I really want to do some like internships and stuff when I'm when, I, when I've done with this. I, I gonna hope my teachers aren't watching when I'm done with the, the boring GCSE stuff. I just want to get out there and have some fun. <laughs> I think what's interesting is we were talking about that kind of what was the that point at which you wanted to go and volunteer. I suppose actually kind of regressing it one step further back is you, you it sounds like you were already kind of engaged with nature and the environment. Do you have any idea where, where that came from? Or has that just always been part of you? I think it's a part of everyone, to be honest, because I don't know one toddler who wouldn't want to see it, who sees a puddle and doesn't want to run up in it and roll around in it. I, I've not met anyone like that yet, um, who's not like that, I guess. But um, I've just, there's always, there's always something, isn't, there's always just something in me. I think my friend always calls it, was it the nature thing? Um, and it's just, it's just something that makes you click, just something that you can just go out and see something and just instantly enjoy it. Um, so for me, it was, 
Well, which I actually, which is one of the kind of first birds I got to identify and the first birds I knew and loved is the goshawk. And as some people will know, I could go on about these birds for hours. Um, but I'm actually sat in the goshawk barn that I watched them go to roost in um, every single evening. And it was when I saw the bird for the first time, I can still remember it. And I had, I was given my first little camera. I was about maybe, you know, maybe 11 or 12 years old. And that was when I, you know, kind of first started talking and moving and stuff and I was first sort of you know making conscious decisions um, and then I was photographing or attempting to photograph the sunset which you can see from the barn and there was this massive silhouette flying across and there was a crow chasing and I thought oh, this is exciting so I changed my lenses and got my bigger lens on and looked through and there was just this this massive raptor and for those of you who have seen sparrowhawks especially smaller goshawk they sort of fly a bit like that and they're just sort of a bit lazy, whereas goshawks, they fly like that. And it was instantly different. And I could see this thing just coming straight across the sunset. And I thought, holy moly. And it had like a crop, which probably got loads of dead squirrels inside. It was the size, I've got a rock here to help me demonstrate. It was the size of a tennis ball. It was this massive thing. And it was, it was I've still got the pictures. It was absolutely amazing. And I pretty much, I think I just sat there in floods of tears, actually, just thinking that, because I, I knew what it was, but I just thought, how cool. My house is just there and there's a goshawk here. And I just thought, that's incredible. And ever since, I've been coming up to this barn most evenings and just watching them fly over and diving into the woodland and making loads of pigeons explode out of it like a missile. And, oh, it's just incredible. I've got hundreds and hundreds of goshawk stories. I shouldn't have said that, but um, I, I could go on absolute years. Um, but I've, I've always, it's, it's always something that I've just kind of had the, the kind of the wild thing. And of yeah. course, growing up here probably helps as well. That is a cracking story. Um, it's kind of like, uh, I think the best word for it is uh, atavistic. It's something ancient inside of everyone because we are of yeah. nature, aren't we? So there, it has yeah. to be in there somewhere, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cool. That is all of the questions and we are nicely to time. So I'm just going to say thanks to everyone who joined us today. I hope you enjoyed the talk as much as um, we did. Um, we have a, a series of talks coming up. There's still a few that you can come and see. I'm going to leave a link to that in the chat in a minute. Um, thanks for all the great questions uh, and thanks to Indy. So it's um, goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. And two little bit from me. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. And hopefully see you at the next stream. <laughs>